So uh, it is my distinct honor to introduce Krista Kelly. Uh, Krista is a graduate from the Center for Vision Research for both her master's and her PhD. And I know that because we were colleagues in the same lab. And I actually was like, do I could do a little show and tell. This picture has been sitting on my mantle for the last couple of decades. Oh. <laughs> Us when we were in our, our where were we babies in our masters, <clears throat> I think. But um, basically, oh, and also, yes, the neuroscience diploma. We were in the inaugural year of the neuroscience diploma program, which is now uh, very, you know, still running successfully. Um, but after graduating, Krista started a postdoctoral fellowship at the Retinal Foundation of the Southwest, where she was the recipient of a highly competitive and prestigious K99 grant. Uh, she then went on to start her own lab as the director of the Vision and Neurodevelopment Lab and assistant scientific director at the Retinal Foundation of the Southwest. And she's really a CVR success story, in my opinion, and we are extremely excited to hear about her recent work that she's been doing on the functional consequences of pediatric, pediatric eye conditions. So take it away, Krista. Thank you, and thanks for not telling any embarrassing stories. <laughs> uh, all right. So like Caitlin said, I'm here to talk about functional consequences of pediatric eye conditions. And uh, before I really get into that, I kind of just need to uh, talk about the fact that um, when I was at York University, I worked with Dr. Jennifer Steves, and she really fostered my interest in how vision can impact the development of your brain, especially under atypical uh, circumstances. So when I was in uh, Dr. Steve's lab, I looked at uh, adults that had an eye removed when they were younger because of cancer of the retina and really looked at how that changed their behavior and their brain. And um, with that, then I went on to uh, find a postdoctoral fellowship with Dr. Eileen Birch at the Retina Foundation, who is really a world expert in amblyopia and strabismus. So another form of monocular deprivation, just a, a different kind than what a nucleation is. So um, the, the stuff that I've been doing at the research, uh, the research that I've been doing at the Retina Foundation has been really focusing more on children and how their pediatric eye conditions can impact them on uh, different things. Um, I started off really looking at different treatments to try to help these kids, but I've since uh, stepped away from that and I'm now looking more at the functional consequences. So just a little outline. Um, I am first gonna talk about what amblyopia is. And I know that the uh, topic of my talk is pediatric eye conditions, but all of the pediatric eye conditions that I study can cause amblyopia or lazy eye. So I kind of go back and forth between uh, looking specifically at amblyopia or looking specifically at these different eye conditions with or without amblyopia. And hopefully I'll um, definitely make sure to um, um, delineate what it is that I'm actually talking about. And if anybody has any questions throughout, um, just, just raise your hand or come up and say something if you want to uh, take yourself off mute. So yeah, so um, I'm looking at uh, children with amblyopia and then I'll talk about some of the ocular motor dysfunction studies that I've been doing with them and then really get into more of the functional consequences. So the reading and motor skills uh, issues that these kids are having. So just a brief overview of what amblyopia is. It is uh, typically called lazy eye, and it is the most common cause of monocular vision impairment in children. And it impacts around 3% of children in the US. I would say it's about the same thing in Canada. Um, so amblyopia is reduced visual acuity that is associated with having binocularly discordant visual experience early in life from different pediatric eye conditions. And these eye conditions include having strabismus, so having an eye turn, one or both eyes being turned, an isometropia, which is unequal refractive air between the two eyes, or more rarely, a cataract. So you can have these things when your vision is still developing. Now, because cataracts are really uh, kind of rare and it takes a long time to collect data from these kids, the focus of my talk is really gonna be on the children that have strabismus and an isometropia, but all of the research that I do with these kids, I also uh, do with children that have cataracts. So if you have any questions about the cataract kids later on, you can just ask me. So we all know, being at the Center for Vision Research, that vision is not fully mature at birth, and it continues to mature beyond infancy. 
Normal visual development depends on having equal input from the two eyes so that connections can form in the brain that combine this information together. And so the key is that both eyes must work together during a critical period of development. Having that uh, discordant visual experience from a misaligned eye or a blurry eye can lead to a whole host of vision problems. And one of those problems is interocular suppression. So the, um, the brain is really listening more to the strong eye and suppressing that uh, amblyopic or blurry eye. And having chronic suppression can actually lead to the visual acuity deficit that we see with amblyopia. So they'll have um, you know, less than 2032 in, in their amblyopic eye. We also see binocular impairments. So a lot of these kids have decreased stereo acuity. So the 3D depth perception is off and they also have motion impairment issues, uh, motion perception issues. So the mainstay of treatment for amblyopia is occlusion of the preferred eye to force use of the amblyopic eye. And patching, seen here, is the most common form of occlusion. You can also use drops that, that uh, would blur the fellow eye, but the key is to get the amblyopic eye to see while covering up the fellow eye. And there's been a ton of randomized clinical trials looking at this. Um, it's been a treatment that's been around for a century or more. Um, but these randomized clinical trials have found that patching is effective and that with about 16 weeks or 200 hours of treatment, vision can improve for these kids about one to two lines in their amblyopic eye. But even though patching has shown to be effective, there still remain a lot of issues. Randomized clinical trials have shown that 40% of children may fail to achieve normal visual acuity with patching, and that 19 to 50% of those that do get better will experience a recurrence of amblyopia, so their vision will regress. Further, normal binocularity is rarely restored, which might be due to the fact that the eyes are not really forced to work together during patching treatment. So this means that even though there's, you know, a, a children who might have good visual acuity with patching, they still have a lot of other issues like uh, decreased stereo acuity. And this can happen with even uh, months or years of treatment. And um, these deficits can really persist into adulthood as well. On top of these sensory deficits, so the, the, the suppression, the decreased visual acuity, the binocular uh, stereo acuity impairments, we also see ocular motor dysfunction. So they have um, problems such as abnormal saccade initiation and execution. They have reduced virgence and they also have fixation instability. So ocular motor dysfunction that results from um, binocularly discordant visual acuity um, uh, results in all the stuff that I said, so I'm going to the next one here. Um, <clears throat> So to show you what fixation instability looks like, here is a comparison of a normal eye on the top. And then uh, this eye stays relatively stable while somebody is fixating on something. And then there's an unstable eye on the bottom that moves around quite a bit. And here's an example of that fixation instability on a, a sort of a fundus photograph here. This is taken with the NIDAC. Um, and uh, you can see here, this is a child with a nice metropia that has unstable fixation. And this is during monocular viewing. So they have one eye covered while we're recording the other eye. So this child is trying to focus on that red circle. The video's working here. Okay, so the video isn't working. Let me get it up again. Okay, there you go. Um, so the child's trying to fixate on that red circle, but you can see their eye drifts off and then quickly uh, saccades back to be able to fixate on that circle. And so we quantify this instability using the bivariate contour ellipse area. And this is an ellipse that encompasses fixation points for a given number of eye positions during one fixation trial. So a smaller BCEA would correspond to having more stable gaze, whereas a large BCA would correspond to having uh, more unstable fixation. So because this child has a pretty unstable fixation, they're having a hard time fixating on that circle, their BCEA, that yellow ellipse, is much larger than what the target area is. 
And here is an example of a kid that has stable fixation. So they're still trying to fixate on that red circle. The eye is moving around a little bit. These are just normal micro saccades that happen uh, during gaze. And because their fixation is pretty stable, you can see that they have a much smaller BCEA uh, with their fixations falling within that red target. So these, these recordings are taken with the uh, NIDEC, um, which only records one eye at a time during binocular viewing. And there's been a lot of studies that they're showing that fixation instability is indeed impacted in these kids uh, with amblyopia and strabismus when um, they're viewing monocularly. Um, amblyopic eye is always worse than the fellow eye, but a lot of studies haven't really looked at what happens when kids are viewing with both eyes. Do they still have that instability? And, um, you know, the thing that I'm really interested in is how do children do in their everyday lives? And um, kids in their everyday lives are walking around with both eyes open. So all of the stuff that I do really focuses on binocular viewing. And um, just to kind of give you a little um, overview of the participants that take part of my studies before I start getting into any of my actual studies. Um, we usually test children age four to 12 that are diagnosed with strabismus. And this is esotropic strabismus where the eye is turned in. You can have one or both eyes turned in. I don't really uh, study children that have one or both eyes turned out because for some reason that doesn't result in as much uh, amblyopia or issues in these children as the eyes turned in. So I really focus on esotropia. And I make sure that the children that I study have their eyes aligned within six to 10 prism diopters. And the reason why I do that is because I'm, I'm really interested in how the brain has adapted to these vision problems uh, that the kid has had. And in order for me to do that, they need to have whatever the eyeball problem was fixed. So if they had strabismus, they have their eyes uh, aligned with surgery or glasses. If they have an isometropia, they have glasses on to fix their prescription. If they've had a cataract, the cataract is out. And now I'm testing kids at their best corrective visual acuity that they can have after those eye conditions are uh, kind of dealt with. Um, yeah, so the children are diagnosed with strabismic or an isometropia and they can have amblyopia or not have amblyopia. I like to have uh, the two different groups to kind of get at whether or not the condition is the issue or the amblyopia is the issue. For amblyopia, they, they have age normal, fellow eye visual acuity, 0.2 logmar or worse in the amblyopic eye. So that's about 2032 or worse. And then two lines difference between the two eyes. I also always test age match controls, children that don't have any vision problems and there's no prematurity, coexisting developmental reading or learning disorders. So just to give you the general participants slide so that I don't have to keep going over all the different participants for all of my uh, studies. So one of the first things that I started doing uh, at the Retina Foundation was looking at ocular motor dysfunction in children that have uh, amblyopia. And we did this using the iLink 1000 eye tracker. I'm sure that a lot of you guys at the CVR have uh, seen this thing. Um, and so what we did was a pretty simple task. We just had children binocularly fixate a small dot for 20 seconds. And we did this three times. Um, and we are able to get their BCEA per eye. So we uh, get a measure of fixation instability for the non-preferred eye as well as their preferred eye. And then we also get a measure of vergence instability. And that is really just the left eye position minus the right eye position. And that gives us an indication of if the eyes are stable, are they moving together or are they moving in opposite directions? So are they conjugate or are they disconjugate? So this slide here kind of just shows you a couple of examples of fixation instability that we might see with these kids. So on the top here is a control child. Um, and this is their eye position on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. Uh, and for 20 seconds, the control child is doing pretty well, staying pretty stable. There's a couple of different micro saccades there, but that's normal. And then on the right here, I'm showing what their BCEAs look like. So for the right eye, the left eye, the BCAs are pretty small. And then that virgin instability, so the difference between the two eyes is also very small. 
indicating that the eyes are moving together when they do move. So then here is an example of a child that has an isometropic amblyopia. And uh, they have unstable fixation, mainly based on the fact that their left eye, so here are the different, uh, what the different colors mean. So the left eye is floating in, so drifting as the child is staring at this dot. The other eye is staying the same. So their non-preferred eye has a large, uh, a large BCA, whereas the preferred eye looks pretty good. And then divergence instability, so that difference between the two eyes is uh, large. So the eyes are not really moving together when they're staring at the dot. Then here's another example of fixation instability, but this one instead is due to nystagmus. So that's that sawtooth waveform that you see here. And for this child, um, they had large uh, BCA in their non-preferred eye. It's a bit bigger in their preferred eye, but not too bad. And then a large virgin sensibility, suggesting that the eyes are not really moving together when they're unstable. Now, I, I do show examples of having the preferred eye being pretty good, but there are also a lot of children that have their preferred eye have just as large of a BCEA as their non-preferred. Um, so we do see that there's some instability in the fellow eye as well. So these are the data, um, just claps across the eye for fixation instability, and then the virgence instability here on the right. And what I'm showing is that children that have amblyopia with strabismus and anisometropia, that their BCAs are definitely larger than the controls. I'm also showing that the non-amblyopic children that have strabismus or anisometropia also have uh, large fixation instability compared to controls. So it's not just having amblyopia that really gives you that instability. It might be the having that discordant binocular input early in life that can cause it. We also see the same thing for virgence instability where the BCAs for that are larger than the controls. And remember, this is all during binocular viewing. So one eye has good vision. We also kind of look at different um, sensory outcomes to see if they're correlated with any of these uh, fixation and stability um, measures as well. So what we found was that the non-preferred eye instability and the virgence instability was associated with having reduced stereoacuity and a larger um, amount of suppression. So these are more, so, say, like binocular impairments but it was not impacted by what the degree of visual acuity was. So um, this gives us an indication that these binocular impairments are the things that are associated with it, not having that amblyopia. So the reason why I kind of uh, wanted to talk first about just ocular motor function is um, that a lot of the stuff that I do really focuses on looking at how eye movements are contributing to some uh, functional consequences that we see in these kids. Um, and these consequences are reading and eye-hand coordination. And I really wanted to look at these things since they also develop in tandem with vision. And if there are um, problems with vision early in life, especially these binocular impairments that we see with these kids, do these functional consequences, the things that kids have to do in their everyday life, also get um, impacted by it? I see something in the chat. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah. So if you do have questions, don't don't uh, hesitate to ask anything. Um, right. So the so what I'm going to start talking about now is the stuff that I've been doing, looking at reading in kids. And I started this in my postdoc, and um, I just I we've been finding so many things that the, that I just need to keep going with it to see um, see how we can help these kids. So. You know, there have been previous studies that have shown slow reading in amblyopic children in adults. Some of these studies, though, used heterogeneous groups of varying forms of monocular vision loss, so they didn't really just focus on one thing, um, or they focused only on strabismus, not really looking at the impact of amblyopia. Further, none of them used uh, non-natural conditions um, like oral reading and one-line sentences while they were viewing with just one eye. And you know, while it's important to determine the function of the amblyopic eye, just in case they lose the fellow eye, 
Um, it's just as important to determine how amblyopia can affect daily activities like reading under natural binocular viewing conditions. So um, what I did was I assessed reading in children. And to do this, we used the Readalyzer uh, eye movement recording system, which are the goggles here. And these goggles provide information such as how fast a child can read and how their eyes are moving through text. So in the study, we had child silently read grade appropriate paragraphs with both of their eyes open wearing these goggles. After the paragraph, they were asked 10 comprehension questions to make sure that they paid attention. And uh, we tested children who finished grades one through six. So the graph that I'm showing right here uh, shows the, the reading rate in words per minute for the amblyopic group. And we also tested children that had strabismus but no amblyopia, just to kind of tease apart whether or not it's strabismus that's actually causing the slow reading. And then we also uh, had a control group. And what we found was that children with amblyopia read about 25% slower than the control group. And then that the kids that had strabismus but no amblyopia didn't have any issues. So this kind of um, points to the fact that maybe having amblyopia is what's causing slow reading that has been uh, found in previous literature, not the fact that kids had uh, strabismus. So just to kind of visualize what this looks like, here's the little recording that we can get from the readalyzer. Um, so here's a control reader on the left, and you can see that the child reads quite fast, skipping over some words, but in contrast, the child with amblyopia is reading slower and stopping more frequently. And this results in a slower reading rate for these kids. So now that we find that they have slow reading, the question is, why do they have slow reading, especially since they're looking with two eyes and one eye has good vision? So much of the, the reading research that I've been doing in my lab now looks into this. So just to um, sum up a couple little things that I found, um, there's no effect of the type of amblyopia. So if they have strabismic amblyopia or an isometropic amblyopia, it doesn't matter. Um, they, there's also no relationship with the degree of amblyopic eye visual acuity. So really it's just the presence of amblyopia rather than how strong their amblyopia is that's causing uh, the slow reading. So that means that there's, there must be other factors to slow reading then. And that's what I've been looking at. Um, so we know that reading heavily relies on eye movements and ocular motor dysfunction is present in amblyopia. So abnormal eye movements may play a role in this. And so what I'm showing here is a, um, a eye movement recording from the readalyzer from a control on the left here. And uh, you can see that as a child reads through a line of words, they make these little steps called forward saccades. And sometimes they make regressive saccades to look back at a word that they've already read. Now, if you look at the child with amblyopia, you can see that the number of forward saccades that they've made is much more than the control. And so uh, we wanted to look and see if this is something that uh, might be causing the amblyopic kids to read slower. And so when we did look at the number of saccades um, that were occurring during reading in this group, we did find that children with amblyopia made 35% more forward saccades as they were reading than controls did. But their uh, regressive saccades were no different than controls. And then their fixation duration, so how long they uh, looked at the word didn't change. And those two measures, the number of regressive saccades and the um, fixation duration are actually two measures that we often see increased in dyslexia. And I bring that up because um, every talk I give, every paper I submit with this kind of stuff that inevitably comes up. And this is, this is a very different pattern of results than what we would see with uh, a child that has dyslexia. So in another study um, assessing reading in children with amblyopia, we looked more into the relationship of eye movements with reading rate. And this was done on children that had an isometropic amblyopia. So what we found was that reading rate, which is on the y-axis here, is highly negatively correlated to the number of forward saccades that um, the children make as they read. And this is measured with the readalyzer. Then we also uh, took that fixation instability um, 
measure that I had talked about earlier with the iLink and correlated that with um, their reading rate as well. So we, we did both of those tests on the same day. And we found that that also uh, correlated with uh, reading rate, meaning that um, slower reading was related more to um, more saccades and more instability. So, you know, the next kind of logical question is then why are they making more saccades? Uh, why would ocular motor dysfunction be related to uh, slow reading? They might be planning smaller cautious movements because they know that their eye movements are kind of inaccurate, or they might be making regular saccades that are not actually landing in the spot that they need to land. So then they have to make corrective saccades in order to be able to see the whole word. And you know, any of these um, theories might be due to the well-known fixation and stability that we see with the amblyopia and, um, and we do see it correlated here with reading rate. So another theory is that uh, binocular inhibition might be occurring as they read. So they are, um, the amblyopic eye might be suppressing the performance of the fellow eye while they read uh, during binocular viewing. And this would translate into better performance during fellow eye reading uh, than binocular reading. Binocular inhibition has been implicated in slow reading and age-related macular degeneration. Um, so then we just kind of wanted to see if that might be what the cause of slow reading is in our study. So we tested this using the readalyzer and we compare, compared children with amblyopia um, we compared their performance during binocular reading to uh, fellow eye reading. And so I've got that here. Uh, this is reading rate and the number of forward to CODs. So remember, if binocular inhibition is occurring, we would see better fellow eye reading than binocular reading. But for these kids, we can see that reading performance is the exact same. Uh, between the two conditions and that they're still doing worse than uh, the control mean that we have from my other paper. So this uh, indicates that binocular inhibition is not the problem. And it might mean that children are probably just relying on their fellow eye as they read and this might actually be a fellow eye issue. And we know that there have been fellow eye uh, deficits found for tasks like motion perception and also fixation and stability. So this, um, this could, could be the case. So I've shown data from the readalyzer. Um, I will say that the readalyzer is good for assessing reading rate and providing the number of eye movements that we, uh, uh, that we see during reading, but the characteristics of the eye movements are lacking. So we can really just get the number um, of eye movements that they, that they make. So as part of um, my NIH grant that I have, I'm currently using more sensitive technology, the iLink binocular eye tracker uh, to record eye movements during reading. So this tracker can pro provide more specific information for us, like what the quality of the eye movements are like um, so that we can explore more potential factors that are contributing to slow reading in these children. And those um, ocular motor factors might be fixation instability and abnormal saccadic eye movements. So this is just kind of showing you the simple setup. A child is uh, reading a paragraph, grade appropriate paragraph on the screen, while the eye tracker shown here on the bottom is tracking, tracking their eyes as they read. So this is um, their eye movements in real time as they read. And here is um, just examples of the control on the left and an amblyopic child on the right reading with the, uh, with the eye link. You can see that the control is reading a lot faster than the child with amblyopia. And you can also see kind of where they're landing on the words as they go through uh, uh, reading the sentences. And shown here are the fixations uh, that the child made as they read through the paragraph. So the control kid, um, you can see um, that they have a lot less fixations than the child with amblyopia. And so what I'm hoping with this experiment is that we'll be able to see where the children are landing on the words and how many times they're fixating on words and for how long, and maybe um, looking to see if 
there's any fixation and stability that's occurring as they try to read. And I think that uh, with the eye link, we'll be able to really figure out what it is about the eye movements that are causing these children to read slowly. Sadly, I don't have any data to show you. <laughs> we are still analyzing this data. Uh, we've uh, teamed up with uh, Dr. John Kelly in Seattle at Ch Seattle Children's Hospital to be able to analyze the data that come from this. Um, so that's something that we're still working on. I do have uh, pretty much, um, you know, a lot of the data collected. We're just still in the middle of analyzing it. So stay tuned for that. Um, another way that we're looking at the role of eye movements in slow reading is by taking out the requirement for interword saccades. And uh, we're doing this by presenting sentences in a rapid serial visual presentation. So uh, the words come up one uh, at a time. We ask the children to silently read it. Then we ask them a question. And um, based on their yes or no, we uh, say that they could read it. And then we're using a two down, one up staircase to find what the fastest presentation is that they can uh, read and then convert that into words per minute. So the hypothesis is that if, uh, if we remove eye movements uh, from, from the task, then maybe they'll read as, uh, at a similar rate as controls. And then that will give us more indication that yes, these eye movements are what the problem is. So these are uh, preliminary data. Uh, we're still collecting data for this, but I think we have enough to, um, to present at BSS. So my research assistant, Dorsa, is, is um, going to, um, she has this submitted, so hopefully it'll get accepted and she can present it. Um, so what we found was kind of the opposite of what we thought was gonna happen that children with amblyopia are still reading slower than controls during this RSVP task. So removing that requirement for inter-word saccades didn't really help. Um, but that doesn't mean that ocular motor dysfunction is not still at play here because fixation instability might, might be uh, what the problem is. And we did track their eyes while they do this task. So we're looking into analyzing what their fixation stability was like as the uh, words are being shown. So we're thinking that maybe uh, fixation instability would be correlated with slower reading rates. Other factors that we haven't looked at yet and uh, might in the future is whether or not crowding might be an issue. So that's um, just having, a, uh, having trouble reading something when there's a whole bunch of other stuff around it. So, you know, one letter and all the other letters surrounding it um, or a reduced visual span. So those are potential things that we can look at in the future. So um, just to summarize the reading studies that we've been doing, we found that children with amblyopia are slow at silent binocular reading. We found that this is related more to, uh, to increased forward saccades and preferred eye fixation instability, so that ocular motor dysfunction, but removing the need for interword inter saccades doesn't help them read at a faster rate. Uh, we haven't found that it's related to etiology, amblyopic eye visual acuity, or binocular inhibition. And, you know, to kind of put this in more of a everyday context, having slow reading might actually hinder academic success in these children. And we have had a lot of kids come in and their parents looking for reports of what their reading is like so that they can bring it to school and try to get some accommodations for them. One of the things in Texas, and this might be everywhere, um, kids that have poor vision in one eye aren't considered for accommodations because they still have good vision in one eye. So um, we've been really trying to get the information out there that these kids might be reading slowly and yes, they might need some help. So before I go on to talking about fine motor things, did anybody have any questions about the reading stuff? You do maybe unmute or put your hand up although I can't see <laughs> or we can save it to the end so Krista I just have a quick question um okay. and you've touched on it but um I'm just curious about the extent to which their comprehension is is um affected by this reading speed issues yeah so we um we do get their comprehension using those questions. 
And uh, we did not find that there was any difference between the two groups uh, in terms of the comprehension for that first study. Um, comprehension is kind of the measure for their reading speed with the with the RSVP task because if they can't see it, they can't read it. Um, but but we don't see issues with comprehension. They it just takes them a little bit longer to read it. Okay. Hi, Krista. Could I ask you a quick question too? Sure. Sure. Uh, sorry. Um, I was just wondering what you said that you didn't find any difference in the um, backward eye movements, only in the forward ones. And I was wondering whether that measurement was in terms of the number of eye movements or the size or both. So it was the number. Um, with the readalyzer, we could only get the number. We can't get saccade amplitude, latencies, anything like that. So, um, I mean, it could be when it's we- I'm curious because the example you showed us, which I kept looking at, looked like they were jumping back further. Okay, yeah, and you know what? Maybe they are. So. So, I mean, everybody makes regressions as they read mm. kids, especially because they're still learning what, you know, what different definitions of words are and stuff and things might be new to them. So they do make uh, regressions. And I mean, it might be something that I look at to see if the regressions that do happen are just larger in size rather than um, number, th than increased in number. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Doug? Uh, yeah, thanks, Krista. I guess a question and a comment. Going back to where you started about the eye drift, mm -hmm. I was uh, just trying to look at the time course because I used to study ocular drift a lot back in when I was starting out. Yeah. And, and you can diagnose, you know, the, the source of this in part by looking at the time course. It looks if it's a vestibular thing, it's typically a constant drift, where if it's what we call a pulse step mismatch, right, it tends to be more of an exponential time course and company in a stagmas. I'm not sure in that middle panel, but in the combined one, it kind of looks like a exponential, you know, called gaze predict nystagmus, right? Is that correct? Or? So, so uh, a lot of these kids, especially if they've had strabismus, they have latent nystagmus, fusion maldevelopment nystagmus, and um, so this is this is something that uh, occurs if you try to find the right definition of it here for you. Um, latent nystagmus. If you this is happening in binocular viewing, when they're binocularly viewing, the nystagmus could switch, so it could be beating towards their um, their left eye uh, and then beating towards their, um, I guess the right part of their nose. If you cover their eyes, you cover their right eye, then the um, nystagma starts beating in one direction. But if you cover their other eye, it starts beating in the other direction. Mm -hmm. So this, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's a vestibular thing. It's, um, no, it's something no. that comes, comes about with these eye conditions and it's pretty common. No. And it doesn't, it's clearly not just mechanical. I mean, I mean, one source of this kind of drift is what we call an oculomotor integrator deficit. And okay. not much of that old oculomotor theory you've looked into, but uh, usually you know, this is a binocular thing. But uh, a fellow named Mike King was looking at these brainstem neurons and finding a lot of them actually have molecular properties, which on the one hand could be where a deficit originates, but on the other hand can also be a corrective mechanism too. But it's exactly. all about the mechanisms for stabilizing the eye. Mm -hmm. uh, the other comment I just briefly mentioned when you get to the reading, I mean, we, we look a lot at, I mentioned in our meeting earlier about transsaccadic vision and some specific brain areas that are involved in integrating visual features across the CADs and was affected of course that that would also presumably slow down ability to read yeah that's a good point that might i, I mean i've never thought about that that might be something to look into mm -hmm. for sure yeah i mean reading reading is a very high level thing because you know, you know the semantics and meanings in there as well but yeah probably it's got a low level lower level vision co component as well yeah exactly thank you yeah. i'm gonna look into that anything else uh, yeah, I think I'm next. Am I? Nico? Uh, yeah, yeah. 
Um, I, I was wondering whether you whether you looked uh, like you you looked at at children with strabism and um, diplopia probably at the beginning and then they develop amblyopia. Have you looked at the like even before you develop full stra strabism, um, just in normal vision? There's quite a range of the accuracy of your um, the alignment of the optical axis of your of your eyes. So the like the natural variance in heterophoria. Um, could be expected to also um, um, predict reading speed and and um, like eye movement accuracy in um, populations that are not clinically experiencing strabism, but more or less strain of the virgin's system that is not by default aligned, but has has more or less um, a strong heterophoria. Mm -hmm. So from my understanding of phorias is they typically come about when you cover one eye, right? Um, so well, they, they, they become apparent when you cover yeah. one eye, but, or, but, but it, it just means that in the dark or without the structure of a, um, like of an illuminated background, um, your eyes are not aligned. And the moment you, you provide pattern, you, you are able to align them. But um, the larger the phoria, the more work you have to put into it. Okay. Right? Yeah. No, I haven't. I haven't thought about that. Um, that's not. We typically don't do like a um, a phoria um, assessment in the controls. We we actually don't do them in the strabismic um, or patient kids either. We just get the information from the doctor when they've done it. Um, but that's definitely something to think uh, about. Yeah, not, that's definitely okay, something okay. to think about. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Anybody else? Sure, I'll, I wouldn't mind asking about uh, cause and effect. Okay. Um, so um, these kids have had surgeries and patchings and all, all sorts of stuff. So they presumably got a late start reading. So I'm wondering if you thought about maybe the fact that they do mini saccades is really more of a signature of them being immature readers rather than rather than the other way around that the ocular motor causing uh, the slow reading the uh, the fact they had amblyopia and they got started late reading that uh, you know, they're still immature basically. Yeah, so I don't know if they would get a, a, a later start reading because, I mean, they still are going to school at the same time as all the other kids. They still have good vision in one eye, and they're typically not doing uh, patching while they're in school. They usually do it at home for like two hours um, a day. So I wouldn't say that they get a late start at it, but um, in saying that, I, I have been wondering whether or not, you know, things earlier in life might impact how they develop their reading skills. So I am doing a study right now looking at um, early literacy skills. So these are things like definitional vocabulary, phonological awareness, and uh, print knowledge. And these three things are very predictive of how a child learns how to read. So if they do good on this test, then they are um, likely to become good readers. So I am looking at that to see if maybe they're, before they even learn how to read, if there's any issues that are coming about. And so far, um, I don't see anything. Um, but I mean, it might be, it might be interesting to kind of see if some of these kids are, um, I don't know, having trouble when they first start learning how to read. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think even in things like con convergence insufficiency, um, you know, people, people read, well, the kids will read less because it's uncomfortable. Right. That's so true. I yeah. can imagine if you've got strabismus or amblyopia, it's even worse. Right. Well, I mean, it might be interesting to just kind of see if there's any relationships between having that discomfort when they read and um, if they're doing um, worse on these kinds of tasks. Good point. Thanks. Anything else? Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to get into motor stuff. So reading is one big part of the stuff that I'm doing. I'm also really uh, interested in seeing how uh, these eye conditions impact children in their motor skills. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in this because this also develops in tandem with vision. 
And um, we know that fine motor skills, manual dexterity things are really important for learning since learning uh, tasks in the first few grades of school really involve manipulating objects so you can learn how to count and learn vocabulary. So if your vision is affected during a critical period of development, these motor skills may also be impacted. So as part of my postdoc, I assessed motor skills in children that had anisometropia or strabismus using a standardized test of motor ability, which is the movement assessment battery for children. And this assessment um, breaks it down into three main categories, manual dexterity. So children do things like put pegs into a board, uh, board pegs into a piggy bank, coins into a piggy bank, pegs into a board. <laughs> um, or they'll do some aiming and catching with a bean bag or a ball. And they also do balance tasks. So standing on one foot, um, walking or hopping. And um, based on their age, these uh, scores are converted into standardized scores. So I'm showing here the standardized scores, and I broke it down into kids that had amblyopia uh, because of strabismus or anisometropia. We also had kids that had strabismus or anisometropia that were non-amblyopic and then controls. And what I found was that for the amblyopic kids, they scored lower across the board than controls. The controls are sitting at um, uh, the standard score of 10, which is about 50th percentile, which is where you would hope controls are. And um, then for this total motor score, which takes into account the whole test, they're also scoring, lo scoring lower. However, uh, the kids with uh, no amblyopia, but still with strabismus and anisometropia, they're scoring lower on the manual dexterity, but they're not scoring lower on the aiming and catching or balance. Uh, but they are having a total motor score that is lower, probably because of their manual dexterity scores. And we also wanted to see if there was any factors related to, um, to these scores. And what we found was that um, for the most part, having an infantile onset and having strabismus and having impaired binocular function tended to be the things that impacted um, these tests the most. Although manual dexterity um, also had a lot of uh, uh, correlations here with, um, or so, uh, sorry, this is different, different than controls. Um, so for the most part, it was having an infantile onset, strabismus, and impaired binocular function. And a lot of studies out there looking at motor skills in amblyopia or strabismus do tend to show that binocularity impairments are more predictive um, than, than severity of amblyopia. Um, yeah, so because fine motor abilities are important for academic success, we wanted to also see how that uh, these fine motor impairments might trans translate into a more academic task, which is transferring answers onto a multiple choice answer sheet. So children uh, were given a Scantron sheet, which we've all seen before, and they've been given a uh, Texas star test that's publicly available. And what we did was we circled the answers in the test 40 questions, and they were asked to only transfer the answers onto that sheet and not to read the test because we really just wanted to see how long it takes them to, to fill out these circles. And what we found was that kids that had amblyopia were about 28% slower than controls at transferring these answers. And then also that children that had strabismus but no amblyopia were also slower. So that might be because of the binocular deficits that we see in kids that have strabismus. So this is, um, you know, this finding has academic implications for children, especially if they're slow at reading as well. So if they're doing these time standardized tests that we typically see in school, especially the older grades, they are slower at reading, they're slower at transferring these answers, they might actually not have enough time to finish the test because of the fact that they're slower at these things. And as I mentioned before, uh, schools right now really don't offer accommodations for kids that have amblyopia. They really only just focus on kids that have bilateral visual impairment. So this was just kind of a, a cool little study to show that um, maybe school uh, performance might be impacted in these kids because of something like this. So those are things that I kind of did in my postdoc. Um, we see that yes, 
there are fine motor impairments in these kids. And I'm now interested in finding out why that might be occurring. So I'm, right now I'm looking at temporal eye hand coordination. And so coordination of the eyes and hands are imperative while you manipulate objects. Fine motor impairment suggests that the development of eye hand coordination might be affected by amblyopia early in life. Previous research shows that fine motor kinematics are impaired in amblyopic children, and um, they are slow to plan and execute reaching movements and have inaccurate grasp as they do a grasping task. We also see that amblyopic adults have reduced peak acceleration and prolonged acceleration duration while they reach. So that's the, the initial approach to an object. And we also see that um, temporal eye-hand coordination is associated with increased corrective saccades in amblyopic adults. So they'll make uh, a secondary saccade to, uh, to get to the target as they're reaching. So as part of my NIH grant that I have right now, I'm currently collaborating with Eva Nikwik Shvedo and James Tong at the University of Waterloo to be able to investigate how the eyes are moving and how the hands are moving and also how they coordinate with each other while they do reaching and grasping tasks. So here is an example of the task. So the kid holds on to a stick right here and then they reach out and touch a small dot that comes up on the screen. Pretty simple task. While they do it, I'm recording their eyes with the eye link. And then I'm also recording their hands with the leap motion controller shown here. And this is um, just an infrared camera that can pick up the hands as they reach out to touch the dot. So here's a visualization of the, of the leap here. It can um, pick out your fingers and, and make a model of the fingers, the palm and the arm. And so from the, from the LEAP data, we can extract the information um, and we can pick out two kinematic events. We can pick out the reach initiation. So that's when uh, the velocity of the finger, um, I track the, the index finger because that's what they're pointing with. Um, that's when the velocity of that exceeds 20 meters per second. So they're moving now. Then we're also looking at the reach termination. So when do they touch that dot? And that's when the velocity falls below 100 meters per second. Um, and that's kind of shown here in figure A. This is the finger displacement. At time zero, the target comes on. So uh, before the target comes on, they're just looking at a fixation cross. Then the dot comes on, plus or minus five degrees uh, to the left or right of fixation. And it takes them about 350 milliseconds to finally start moving. And then they move towards the dot and then they touch the dot. So based on these two kinematic events, we can get these five different measures. We can get the reach reaction time. So that's uh, shown here in B. This is based on the velocity thresholds. So we can get the reach reaction time. How long after the target came on did it take them to initiate that reach? We can get the total reach duration. So the time it took from them when they first started to reach to when they ended their reach. We can get the peak velocity. So how fast were they at their fastest? And then based on these three different things, we can break the, the movement down into an acceleration duration. So that, that initial approach is a more ballistic approach. They speed up and this phase um, kind of reflects the planning of the, uh, of the movement. And then we can get the deceleration duration, which is the final approach to the object. And um, this phase um, really is um, more all about using the visual feedback. So this is a more feed, a feedback phase. So those are the things that we're looking at while uh, we analyze this data. And so here's what we're finding. This is um, data that just got accepted like yesterday <laughs> uh, into IOVS. And um, so I'm showing here just an example of one trial from a child that has strabismus with um, the dotted line here and a, ch a control child. And these data are only in the strabismic children. I'm still looking at the anisometropic children. So what we're finding is that strabismic children are taking longer to reach. So um, in the graphs here, that total reach duration, they're taking longer than controls to reach out and touch uh, the dot. And um, what you can see is that 
the um, reach duration is actually being driven by having a longer deceleration duration. So they're not taking any longer in that acceleration phase, but in the deceleration final approach phase, they're taking longer the controls. And that's kind of shown in that example here. So you can see that the strabismic kid slows down pretty much at a constant velocity and then finally touches the dot. So I always have to look at factors associated with um, with impairments because there's a lot of stuff that you know is it's going on with these children, and uh, the things that we found that were associated with slower reach are having surgery. So some of the, some strabismic children don't need surgery; glasses will fix fix the problem. Having amblyopia, having nil stereoacuity, so no 3D depth perception that we can measure, having um, uh, large suppression as well. And the kids that didn't have surgery, the kids that did not have amblyopia, the kids that um, did have some binocular function tended to do fine compared to controls. I will say though that once we uh, did a multiple regression to see what might be predictive of slow reaching, amblyopia, the degree of amblyopia was not a factor. So the fact that children that are amblyopic are slower is probably because those kids also have um, binocularity impairments as well. It's kind of hard to tease apart those things, um, but that multiple regression uh, showed us that binocular impairments are actually predictive, not, not the amblyopic eye acuity. So I'm also uh, collecting uh, eye movement data while they do this task. And we're still analyzing these data. Uh, it's taken a, a bit of a time to figure that out. But um, what I wanted to show you is what I'm really interested in is the temporal eye-hand coordination. So here is uh, the saccade happens usually before the arm starts or before the hand starts to move. And so I'm really interested in that uh, timing between when the eye starts to move and when the hand starts to move, because that might give us some indication that there's um, that there's some dysfunction going on in terms of how they're talking to each other. Here are some preliminary data of the saccades that I do have. And um, this has been submitted to uh, a meeting in May. And what we're finding is that children that have strabismus have longer saccade onset latency during this task. So it's taking them longer the controls to start moving their eyes to go look at that dot. But once they start moving their eyes, they're no different than controls. So they have no difference in the saccade amplitude. So how accurate are they in looking at the dot, the velocity of the saccades, that temporal eye-hand coordination that I was really interested in, um, or the frequency of corrective saccades. Um, so this is, this is a little bit different than what I thought we would find, um, especially since we do see in strabismic adults um, that they have normal saccade latency, but then they tend to have more reach-related corrective saccades. And what that tells me is that there's some sort of compensatory strategy that's happening um, between when you know, your child and an adult in order for you to be able to actually um, reach out and touch that dot as accurate as you can. So for this task, we've shown slow reaching in strabismic children, and that um, it's really due to longer deceleration. And this is actually different than what we see with tra strabismic adults who have um, longer acceleration duration. And again, this could be a compensatory um, uh, strategy that happens as you gain experience. We also um, think that the longer deceleration in these kids indicates a difference in control that could be due to having reduced ability to use visual feedback as they, um, as they are in their final approach to that dot. And you know, the hope is that maybe someday the data that I'm getting with these experiments is that we will be able to guide development of more effective screening and interventions for these kids so that they don't have so many issues with, with their motor um, motor skills. And we've also been piloting, um, uh, uh, looking at a more complex task, which is grasping. And I'm still trying to figure out the, the you know, little things with it. It's a tiny bit more difficult for the leap to pick up the hands as 
we uh, do something like reach out and grasp an object. But what I'm doing is pretty much the exact same setup as the reaching um, experiment, except now I'm adding the element of a child grasping a Lego and putting it in a different spot. And with that, we can get all the same information. Um, I'm tracking their saccades with the eye link. It's, in, um, it's put in this tower because uh, before the hands were blocking uh, as they were grasping, or I couldn't pick up their eyes because now they're looking down instead of up at a screen. Um, so I'm still piloting with the leap for that, but in anticipation that I wanna continue doing these types of motor experiments, I've recently acquired a Qual Assist motion capture system which is similar to um, an Optitract and is a lot more sensitive and can, can give me a lot more information. The leap that we have um, has some spatial limitations. There's, there's good temporal resolution, but not good spatial resolution. So um, because of that, I wanted to get something that's more sensitive so that I can figure out things like accuracy and also um, say for this task, when a kid is grasping something, what's their grasp aperture like? Because there is uh, research showing that they tend to have a larger grasp aperture as they approach the object, uh, probably to make sure that they actually pick it up instead of knock it down. So that's one thing that um, I'll be doing soon. And then, um, you know, I've been looking at all these fine motor skills, but as I showed you in the movement assessment battery uh, experiment that I did, that there's also deficits in aiming and catching and balance. And um, so the next step for me then is to look at eye body coordination, not just eye hand coordination. And so what I'm doing right now, um, yeah, and this is uh, the movement assessment battery task showing um, for static balance. So standing on one or both feet, kids tend to be um, scoring lower than controls. So what I'm doing right now is investigating the role of eye movements during static balance using the Toby glasses too. And this is a wearable eye tracker. So children are not restricted to sitting in a headrest for this. They can actually walk around the environment. Um, and I'm pairing it up with an NIH Toolbox uh, iPod app that has a balance subtest on it. And so what this is, we uh, get the children to wear the Toby eyeglasses and um, they have the iPod attached to their waist. It's just a little tiny iPod. And the iPod uses the, um, the accelerometer in there to get the postural sway from these kids as they do this balance task. And there's four or five tasks. Um, but for the most part, I'm really interested in the ones where they have their eyes open. Some of them, they have their eyes closed. Um, and sometimes they're standing on a hard floor. Sometimes they're standing on a foam to decrease stability. And then um, they're asked to stand, stare at this uh, fixation cross in the middle. I recently put a picture of Nemo in there so that it's more fun for them to look at. <laughs> and, um, and then cross their arms and stand as long as they can for 50 sec up to 50 seconds. And so these are just very uh, preliminary data. Um, I've just started this experiment and we're playing around with how to analyze the data. But um, what I'm showing here is a control child and a child with amblyopia. And um, this is pose one, where they are standing just on the hard floor with their eyes open. Pose four, where they're standing on the foam with their eyes open. And what I want to look at is see whether or not fixation and stability might be uh, contributing to unstable balance in these kids. There is some research kind of showing that uh, that might be the case. So here I'm showing the fixation points with the Toby glasses. The control is doing a pretty good job of staying in the middle. Amblyopic kid is all over the place. Um, so what we want to do is get this information so that we can calculate a BCEA while they're trying to do balance and then correlate it with their scores. So with the NIH balance task, um, it gives you this report. So it, there's four to five tasks depending on your age but it'll come out with a fully corrected T-score for the whole set of tasks. And here you can see the control has a higher score than the amblyopic kid, showing that the control kid did better. <coughs> and then we also can get some ratios of how they did on one task compared to the other one. So the one that I'm interested in here is um, 
position two, which is standing on a hard floor with their eyes closed versus standing on a hard floor versus their eyes uh, with their eyes open. And that gives us an indication of how much they're relying on vision for their balance. So the control child has a score of two. That means that they did worse in the eyes closed versus eyes open condition but the amblyopic child has a score of one, meaning they perform the same. So they're performing just as bad with their eyes open as their eyes closed, which might mean that they're not really relying on vision when their eyes are open to help them balance. So this is just preliminary data that I have. Um, I've put this into a grant recently that I'll hopefully get uh, to be able to uh, continue collecting data. Um, and the hope is, you know, to really kind of see are, are the eye movements contributing to how they're doing. And we can, um, you know, this is the fully corrected T-score for this, the whole set of tests, but we can also get the, uh, the normalized path link per task so that we can try to correlate that with the fixation stability that happens during that one condition. Um, and then the next step is also trying to figure out what are the contributions of eye movements to how they walk? We do see that they have some issues with dynamic balance as well, uh, based on that movement assessment battery test that I have. So I've recently gotten the GateRight mobile walkway system that I can sync up to the Toby Pro glasses that I have. And so we can get children to walk on this mat. We can put obstacles down if we want, and um, we can you know do it with both eyes open, one eye open. Um, and this mat will give us uh, information such as where they're putting their feet, how long their stride is, how long do they keep their feet down before they pick it up. Um, so I'm hoping that this um, will give us a lot more information about how the children are walking. I also have plans to put a set of stairs at the end of this and with force, force plates um, to see how they walk up steps as well, because I know that these kids have issues with, with steps. Um, so that's it for the motor stuff. Um, I'm not going to get too much into the self-perception stuff because I want to make sure we have enough time to finish. But I just want to say that, um, you know, a lot of these children, they have these issues, but does it actually make them feel bad about themselves? And the answer is yes. So we've been finding that these kids tend to have um, lower perceptions of themselves in how their physical competence is, their peer acceptance. Uh, these are for the younger kids. And then for the older kids, how well they do in school and how well they do socially and athletically. So, um, you know, they, ha they have these impairments, but it's also kind of impacting how they feel about themselves and maybe uh, restricting the activities that they might be um, participating in. So just in general, um, my research is finding that discordant input early in life from pediatric eye conditions can impact ocular motor function. It can impact functional tasks that rely heavily on eye movements like reading and fine motor skills, even when they have both eyes open and also disrupts the development of an eye hand coordination and even self-perception. And one thing that I uh, want doctors to know when I usually present this at you know, ophthalmology meetings and stuff is that when these kids are being treated, it's really the visual acuity impairment that they can treat with the patching. But after that, then th the other deficits that come along with this is not really a concern for the doctor anymore. Although I'm sure they're concerned, there's just not much that they can do. So I'm hoping that um, the, the data that we get from my research will really help to inform parents, educators, and doctors that maybe some of these kids might need some help in school. Um, and that, you know, having these binocularity and motor impairments also might increase their risk of injury. There's lots of research showing that adults that have binocular impairments are more at risk of injury. And that amblyopia is not just a childhood condition, that it really persists into adulthood as well. And with that, I want to thank my um, collaborate, my lab and my collaborator. So um, these are the um, awesome research assistants that I have in my lab. And then I'm I'm at the Retina Foundation, um, and I still, you know, collaborate a lot with Dr. Eileen Birch and her lab. And then at the University of Waterloo, uh, Eva is um, really helping me a lot with the point to touch stuff that I'm doing as long as well as the engineers there. And then Dr. John Kelly in Seattle has been helping me with my reading um, eye movement analysis stuff. And then one last thing, I cannot um, 
do a talk at York without acknowledging my old graduate supervisor, Jen Sieves and her lab. And I think this might be the very first photo that we ever took together at the CVR Christmas party. <laughs> and um, I really miss those parties. I'll tell you, those were the highlight of my year. I also miss uh, all of the lab members that were at, um, at York in the Steve's lab, um, Caitlin, who you guys know, and Steph and uh, Lily, as well as a whole bunch of other people that were in her lab. We used to have movie nights, which I really miss. Um, I think we watched the whole uh, Twilight series as well as the whole Harry Potter series <laughs> in her lab. And I have um, made sure to bring that tradition to the Retina Foundation, although COVID has kind of put a stop to that. And I also miss the parties that Jen used to have at her house. Um, one time she took us to a hill near her place and we just slid all day. And um, I don't get snow anymore in Dallas. So I really miss that. Anyway, I just wanted to give a shout out to her because she's been awesome and still really supports me in things that I do. So if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer more. Nico? I think we're I just clapping for you. Oh, I have, I have a question. I don't have any particular question. I think Denise has a question, though. Yeah, yeah although my kids are really noisy. Um, so I was interested in the uh, balance research. The, so you recorded the um, eye fixations in that part, but it didn't seem like uh, whether they're standing on a fixed support or a, a soft support, it really made a difference to their eyes. And, and obviously the control would be what happens with their uh, eye movements when they're just sitting. And did you, in the same group, also um, have them just kind of a control condition, whether they're sitting or, or even lying down? We have absolutely no balance constraints. You know, that might actually be a really good idea. So, um, so as of right now, I've only just um, paired it up with the task that the NIH balance has and not thought about putting anything different in there. But that might be a good control, um, a good control one, yeah. Because yeah. it might be that their eyes are constantly moving independent of anything like with balance. And you have to almost rule that out yeah. by having something where where they they're showing better fixation when they don't have that challenging um yeah. extra challenge of balancing yeah that's that's a really good idea i'm going to do that thank you thank you anybody else yeah there's a few hands there i think zoha you were next hi yeah great talk um we also do OptiTrack work with kids um, and they absolutely love the system and it has great data, good. really good sensitivity. Yeah, and the kids, even with the kids being like finicky and playing with it, the data is always, almost always awesome. So I definitely yeah. recommend that. Yeah, I know that uh, Eva has an OptiTrack and uh, she's been like, you know, playing around with the Leap as well. And I started using the Leap just to help me with, you know, this one project. And if we see anything, then there, it's grounds for me getting a better, a better system. But the OptiTrack is obsolete now. And I was so sad when I found that out because I wanted to buy it. So I had to go with a different system. Um, so okay. yes, I'm glad that it works with kids too, because that's, that's always an issue. Yeah, we just tested two days ago. I think, I think you're Sorry, confusing you the opto track with the opti track, right? Yeah, so there's. You were talking about opto track, and so are, so are in their lab, they have an opti track. Opti. Yeah. Oh, is, yeah. it, is it still. Which is, very, which is similar to the Qualysis. Uh, okay. System, whereas the opto track is, is an active, completely different. Okay. Kind of... Okay. Yeah, I do remember now when I was trying to uh, research it that there was something that was very similar that kept popping up. Yeah. Yeah, we've used both systems, but now we only use the OPT track, but oh, still really okay. good, yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, and then I just had a question. Do you find differences between their performance depending on which eye is affected um, with the reading, with the motor skills? You know, I've never looked at it, but that would be a very simple thing to do. I wouldn't expect... Yeah. I mean, it might, it might for their motor skills, just because, mm -hmm. I mean, if they're right-handed and left eye amblyopic, that might be different than than left-handed and right eye, right eye amblyopic, but we don't really get a lot of left-handed people, but um, I never really thought to look at the eye that might be affected. I can look at that. Yeah, so, I, I'd be really interested to look at those results. I, I, I don't know, I feel like there might be a difference, but that'd be really cool to look at. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Especially since if you're reading, you're reading left to right, and th there might be a difference in eye movements left to right, depending on what your, um, what eye is affected. Yeah, we had so the chance to, no... sorry. Yeah, sorry, I, we, we just had the chance to test two children and we found that 
um, one child who was, he, he had absolutely no vision in his left eye. Um, his reading was not that great, obviously, but similarly with another child who's had right eye deficit, his reading was still really good. So just, but these were like simple basic tests. So I'd be interested to see the results. That's a good idea. Yeah, because you would, maybe the left eye amblyopes are doing worse than the right eye. Mm -hmm. oh, good, good. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? I've got another uh, uh, cause and effect question. Um, okay. So in the, in the very first part, you did this very nice, um, uh, very nice data set where you linked uh, binocular function with um, ocular motor instability. And I was just curious if you have some idea of, you know, what's driving that? Because we know that, you know, we need good binocular function in order to have, uh, in order to develop uh, uh, normal ocular motor behavior. And we need good ocular motor <laughs> behavior in order to get good binocular function. So it's kind of a nag. Do you, do you know which is, what's driving it there? What the main? Uh... No, I don't. You know, it's, it's kind of a hard thing. Like what, what's, it's sometimes it might be like a chicken and egg thing. Is the ocular motor dysfunction causing the strabismus or is the strabismus causing the ocular motor dysfunction? Um, it, it seems that there's, that timing is really a factor. So the earlier the onset of it, the more, um, the more instability you would have. So, I mean, I, there definitely is like a brain development situation going on. Um, and, you know, there's some, there's some studies showing that fixation instability in, I think, AMD is actually kind of helping them to see. So if they can't see that well, their eyes are moving a little bit more, I think, to kind of get a better picture of what's going on. Um, so that might be what the situation is, in he, is going on here. I, I haven't really kind of um, explored what, you know, brain mechanisms might be happening in these kids just because the work that I do doesn't directly probe at that, but it is al always, um, you know, something is interesting to kind of find out. But I, I do know that there's, you know, kind of a, we still don't really know why, why they get these oculomotor issues. I don't know if that answered your question or not, but... <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm just, yeah, maybe it's not even important, but it, it possibly might be if, you know, if you can fix it, if it's going to improve things, right? So, yeah, you know, if well, you know training. There, there's, um, there's a lot of research showing that when you uh, align the eyes, that sometimes your brain or, or the, your brain will just make your eye go back to where it was before. Like that was the place it was at when you were born. And now that's where I want you to stay. Yep. Even when the muscles are put in different places, it'll still go back to where it was. Um, so I don't, yeah, I don't know. Thanks. Anything else? It's so hard not to be able to see everybody to see if somebody has their hands up or not. Oh, my hands up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can unshare your slide now and then you'll see everybody. Okay. Okay. Let me do that. Good. Okay. Go okay. Well, just as we talked earlier, Kristen, you asked what I thought about the eye hand coordination stuff. So it's, you know, I was, I got in on this a little bit with Eva some years back when we started looking at it. And uh, I, I think it's just a really rich data set there to look into. And mm -hmm. you kind of, you, you alluded at the end about mechanisms. Like the question is, how deep do you want to go in the mechanisms? Because you, you can look at the descriptive level and then you can start thinking and mechanisms like you mentioned about visual role of visual feedback is one there's very others that we can talk about I want to get into brain mechanisms because the, the tricky bit there is it's it's almost hard to think of an area of the brain that's not involved in eye hand coordination mm -hmm. oh i mean it's everything from visual i was talking about frontal cortex earlier brain stem you know so it's there's so many things that could go wrong in all these different spots so yeah you were interested in that maybe like i was saying earlier like kind of a whole brain type approach might be a way to start but yeah i'd definitely be interested in following up with you on talk about it. for sure yeah you know i was talking to eileen the other day about um how you know when i was in grad school everything that i did even if it wasn't neuroimaging i always relate it back to brain mechanisms because that's what mm -hmm. you know that that was the important thing in the cvr and now 
when I do the stuff that I do, I never relate it back to brain mechanisms because we're not doing, you know, neuroimaging here. And that's, and it's more clinical things, uh, clinical journals that I'm submitting to. So I feel like I've kind of, you know, lost my, my neuroscience well, stuff. <laughs> what, what about uh, EEG though? Would your, you think your, your kids would tolerate uh, EEG? I'm not sure. I know that they used to do uh, VEP stuff here, uh, but with little, little kids to try to see what their visual um, sensitivity was, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. before they could even start doing visual acuity testing with them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Some so kids are, kids are fun to work with, but they're also um, like, you don't know how they're going to react to some things. Like some of them are fine with the eye length. Some of them think it's lasers that are going to hurt their eyes. And I always have to, you know, show them how, how fun it is and put everything into a game. Um, but I, and the EEGs, you still have to put the, the conductive gel on with that syringe and stuff. Right. And I mm. feel like they would just automatically think that was a needle and run away. Mm. But, but yeah. Um, and then there's like the portable MEG systems going around there. You know, it's a step up in expense. Anyway, I mean, it, it would be cool if you could do that. Yeah, I didn't know that they had a portable MEG now. Is it huge? It's, I, I haven't seen one in real life, just online. Like they're, they're almost wearable, so. Cool. Not like the great big ones that were yeah. used in the past. I've definitely been in the one Herb has put me in that before, Herb Goltz, mm -hmm. the one at Sick Kids. Mm -hmm. But, it, but if, the, if the kids could tolerate EEG, there's, I mean, that's gotten so much more sophisticated than it used to be with yep. source localization and the kind of functional connectivity analysis we were talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'll look into it. Anyway, anyway I don't want to hold people up any longer. Any other questions? Hey, Krista, it's yeah. Joe. Oh, hey, how Joe, how are you? Can you see me? Yes, I can see you. Sorry, I was All trying right, to find so you in the, in the grid. <laughs> I, have a, I have a cool question that uh, comes from your, oh, I got to turn off my uh, music here. Uh, I don't know how to do this. Let's see. Yeah, and so what's cool is, so I like your, uh, comment on how the children are feeling not so good about themselves mm -hmm. right and uh and you talk about this and what i just searched um that there's a huge incidence of mental illness in kids with strabismus so okay 2008 paper i just searched so i'm sure you can search this and so i want your opinion on how um how like how can we fix this in the children, make them feel better about themselves before it turns into a mental issue in these people? I have, um, I have no idea. I, I would like to see that paper. Uh, um, I'm just throwing it, I just, throw it, I just threw it in the chat. Okay. And so it says something like 41% of strabismus children who were measured between like, uh, I think it's 85 to 94 at this point in their life, um, it's three, it's some huge percentage. And so you have, in, you have uh, evidence now in your own lab that shows mm -hmm. that this could be the link or a hint that these people are going to need yeah. help. So, future, so I right? see, so how do we do this? Yeah. So I see here now, uh, the, the abstract says that it's kids with exotropia are three times yeah. more likely to develop. So exotropia is when the eye turns out, esotropia is when the eye turns in. If you look at somebody with esotropia versus somebody with exotropia, the exotropia is a lot more aesthetically pleasing than the exotropia. Exotropia looks, looks very harsh, whereas esotropia doesn't look too bad. There's a lot of celebrities with esotropia, like Paris Hilton, um, you know, who you would say there's nothing wrong with them. But um, so, so, and the thing is with exotropia, they sometimes um, they'll wait and see what happens because that could fix on its own. Uh, you don't really get amblyopia with exotropia. Um, and if you're gonna fix it, it's really just for aesthetic reasons. So there's a lot of children that are going around with it that don't get it fixed and it's super noticeable and doesn't look nice. And so that is probably a lot of the problem. But, the, in, your, um, in, but in your pool, you, ex you ignore the exos, right? No, I don't test them. 
I don't, oh, test, don't them. test them. Yeah, okay. we only test the esotropia kids because they're usually the ones that get amblyopia. Yeah. Um, so in your data, in your data, it was the esotropia that were yeah. feeling not so good about themselves. Yeah. 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 So, and, and this paper says that the esotropia kids were no different than controls. So um, I, 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 that's not surprising to me at all because okay. uh, it's so much more noticeable. Yeah, yeah but, but that's, the, that's the, a good call. Like the self-image of a person, if they're not feeling good about themselves when they're a kid, and if, if you can somehow do some sort of like play therapy or drama mm -hmm. therapy or dance therapy with them, they may end up building resilience as a young child yeah. and not end up having a mental illness later in their life. And yeah. I think that's I mean, something you I think that's something you can you can do right now because you have evidence that they're not feeling good about themselves compared to controls. Yeah. And I mean the thing is trying to find out what it is that you can do with them though, right? Because I mean this well, is what so you're I talking can, about I can, is I have I have a colleague in Texas okay. that does dance movement therapy. Um, oh fun, yeah. And what I can do is I can put her in touch with you. And maybe this is a cool little grant that we can look at because uh, you know we've been doing some dance related stuff. Yeah. And, and what's really cool, Doug was mentioning about uh, neural mechanisms. So we been looking at people with Parkinson's and mm -hmm. uh, we see a link in cingulate uh, area 25, which is what, where they put electrodes in for deep brain stimulation. You probably remember this from when I taught you this. Yeah, fun yeah, class I do. Years yeah. ago. <laughs> And uh, it correlates with the uh, geriatric depression scale when we do longitudinal data over eight months. So okay. The change, yeah. the change in our Is it also does it also help with their motor abilities at all? Yeah, yeah, for sure it does. Like yeah, the, all yeah. the data in the world is motor related, but we have this in uh, manuscript we're working on now. Okay. To share with you, but but yeah. I think the cool thing I think the cool thing is you know that these children could need help mm -hmm. just because they have strabismus. And, and, and I think this is a great link to be able to proactively help and reduce mental illness that might happen in 10 years from now. Yeah. So it's something cool. Okay, I gotta go. Uh, okay, thanks, great so. seeing you again. And, you, and you. all the like, old pictures were cool <laughs> at the end. I picked up <laughs> the good ones. <laughs> yeah, I'll flip that email to you later, Krista. Okay, thank you. Good yeah. to see you. Bye. Bye.